Your back is got your back is stiff as starch. This is a mechanized war, they say that saying is sure a bust. Cause all that you see in the infantry is one another's dust. What do you do? I'm sitting here with a true WAMC star, Mr. Paul Elisha. Now, Paul Elisha, who is poet in residence, musician in residence, handles classical music for WAMC, is a guy who's been around for a while. And on this Veterans Day, we want to talk to him about one of his roles in life, and that is being a veteran. A lot of people confuse being a veteran with being patriotic, with being Republican, with being pro-flag, with many of the symbols of the contemporary conservative movement. I think it's fair to say that those of us who know the work of Paul Elisha know that that is not the case. He's a veteran, and the question is, is he representative of more than himself, or is he an aberration? Is he somebody who is representative of all veterans, or is he somebody who stands out in stark contrast to veterans? Let's start by asking Paul Elisha that question. Go, Paul. Well, first of all, Alan, I think we need to look at the term veteran. There are all kinds of veterans. If you look at what I like to call combat veterans, I think almost the majority are anti-war inside somewhere because nobody who's actually been in combat can have a positive thought about war. You know, as the man said, you had to have been there. And it's something that you almost cannot relate to someone who hasn't been there. But it is such a horrendous experience that afterward you just can't be for something like that. There's some people who sort of glorify war and make it out as a, almost a contact sport. They tell stories about it. They say, this is how we beat them at this line or that line. And yet you're painting a different kind of picture. I think that's where the aberration comes in. With Patton, for instance, where they show him saying, God, I love it so. In one of our campaigns at Macon Island, this was a joint campaign with the Marines. If you remember, the big thing in, in World War II was Tarawa, when the Marines went in there and they took something like 8,000 casualties on that little atoll. 90 miles away, across the way, was Macon Atoll. And that, the 27th Division, the 165th, what used to be the old Fighting 69th from New York, went in to take that atoll, and we were the communications people for that. There was a general in charge of that whole operation, H.M. Smith in the Marines. They used to call him Howlin' Mad Smith. <laughs> and he would start every operation on the way. He would gather everybody up on the deck of the ships, and he would give them this talk. And the talk would be about how many Marines have died in how many battles to the glory of the Marines. And he, it was almost as if he was saying, the more that died, the more the glory was. And he actually got angry at the 27th Division because their commander took four days to subdue this island when he wanted it done in two, and he said they were yellow. They didn't want to lose as many men as the army. But I call that an aberration. No commander who really has watched men die wants to send them in to die. How did it all begin for you? Give us time. I mean, you looked at me before, and you, you expected me to remember the history of this one island. And I, of course, am 62 years old, and frankly, yeah. I didn't remember. Yeah. I've read a lot about World War II, but I didn't remember this one thing. So it must be somewhat interesting to you to say, of course, you remember to a 23-year-old or 25-year-old <laughs> Who, who may not even know that there was a Second World yeah. War, to be honest with you. And people half your age don't even know which, what I'm talking about, most of them, unless they've read history. For me, it happened because I had a father who was himself a veteran of World War I, a combat veteran. A Jewish family. A Jewish family. However, I have to tell you that my father came from Texas. His mother came from an intermarried family. And when he arrived at what is now Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, he did not speak either Hebrew or Jewish, mm -hmm. and no one would have thought of him with his Texas drawl as Jewish. He left school freshman year at Texas A&M, 1915, 
He was seduced by Blackjack Pershing, General Pershing, who went looking for Pancho Villa. And who led the expeditionary force. Yes, and my father went off to become a telegrapher with Pershing and stayed in, and then World War I happened, and he came with the expeditionary force, and they were stationed for a while at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, mm -hmm. which was then called Camp Vale, and he met my mother. And I grew up in an atmosphere of very strong, I would say patriotism, love of country. My father was a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. He marched in every parade, took pride in carrying the flag. When Pearl Harbor happened, he was probably one among the first 10 people to try to enlist, but they turned him down. He was too old. Now, how did you get in? Well, I was fired up by this. I think everybody has to remember the time, what, yeah. the context of the time. It was a horrendous time, of course, and I had been fed some of this even before. And I have to tell you, thinking about it now, I became a news junkie because of my grandparents, my mother's parents, who both came from Russia, and they spoke very poor English, mostly Yiddish, but they loved to listen to the news. They wanted very much to be informed citizens. And every night they would listen. They had three things they had to listen to. H.V. Kaltenborn, Gabriel Heater, and Lowell Thomas. I remember all three of them. It shows you how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't understand everything that they said. So they would put the radio on. They would plant me by the radio, and my grandmother would say to me, Polly, what's doctor? What does he say? And I would literally translate from what one of them was saying in English into Yiddish for my grandparents. So I became a Yiddish newscaster, you might say. That's fascinating. Were, were your parents Democrats or Republicans? Oh, we have a standing joke in the family. Jean, my wife Jean still tells it to people that... If I were ever to reach for a Republican lever in the, <laughs> in the booth, my arm would atrophy. <laughs> right. So into this comes, a, a, there's a, been a depression. How did you get through the depression? What was it? Very story? badly. We lived with my grandparents who lost their home. Wow. My father was out of a job for weeks and months. He would get day laboring jobs. It was a rough time. And what happened when you lost your home? We lived in rented quarters yeah. then. Bed. I can remember being on Saturday night being washed in the old stone laundry wash tubs mm -hmm. for a bath. So along comes Pearl Harbor. Where were you at the time? I was then in a high school which has, after 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you've read some history, you may have come across the NYA, the National Youth Administration, one of Roosevelt's many acronyms. This was the beginning of the junior college movement where they took high schools, and after 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they gave you the first two years of college there. Yeah. And I went to one in Long Branch called Monmouth Junior College. Yeah. In pre-journalism, by the way. But now, why were, I'm sorry, I somehow missed the transition yeah. from Texas to Monmouth. How did that happen? Well, when I was one year old, we moved to Texas with my father because oh. he didn't like it up north. And then for the next nine or ten years, we kept going back and forth. My mother would scream and holler. We'd come up for a while, and we'd go back down again. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Beaumont, Texas. Paul, let me ask you a very rude question to sort of set the context for everybody out there. How old are you? I will be 81 this December. Okay. So now the Depression's been rough. You've been doing some high school back in New Jersey with the beginnings of junior college, mm -hmm. you know, afterwards. And December 7th happens. What happens? I went right down to enlist. Did you? I was not accepted because I was under 21 years of age. How and old were you? I was 18. And they, they sent me home, and they said, get your parents' signature, and we'll, we'll let you in. Well, of course, my mother started screaming, you know, he's too young, you can't go, etc. And I kept badgering and lobbying my parents for the better part of a year. Well, and how did your father, the veteran, talk? My father about? was much more inclined because, remember, he had tried to enlist also. Yeah. <laughs> my mother 
giving him the old argument, you know, you're killing your son, etc. Do you think your predisposition to service was in some way reflective of the parental value that your father had transferred oh, I, to you? I'm certain of it because I had had this, you know, poured into me throughout my life. When I was 13, my father enrolled me in the Veterans Drum Corps. You know. So, so I know that you've been noted as a poet by many people. You've written extensively on poetry. You've talked about poetry. Were you a poet then at that point? Uh, my first poems, I have a cousin who sent me poems I wrote when I was nine years old. I was given my first book of poetry by an aunt who was a teacher in New York City schools. And every time they would come to visit us, she would bring me a book of poems. And I got hooked and started to read and then started to write poems myself. Did poetry have a different place in America then than it does now? Oh, yes. I can remember Edna St. Vincent Millay coming to the Ocean Grove Auditorium down on the Jersey Shore, this huge auditorium that was really a place for revival meetings. And I can remember a 1,000 people coming out to hear her. Mm-hmm. So uh, that these were sort of the rock stars of the time. That's right. They were. Yeah. Uh, Vachel Lindsay came to read in Asbury Park. Uh, like hundreds of people came to hear him. And for me, it was thrilling to listen to. Or as one of my wife's students once wrote, hear her. <laughs> 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 it's interesting, though. The, the war for me shut down my poetry. Oh, really? Uh, because I saw a picture in a monograph that you wrote of the poet, and you were holding a, you were landing on a Pacific island, and you were holding a radio in yeah. your hand, and you self-identified because you wrote the monograph as a poet. Well, uh, but that was written, you know, how many years later? Yeah. Many years later. But during the war years, I did not find it within myself to write. For one thing, war turned out to be so horrendous, nothing that I had ever dreamed of that it could be like this. And my father, as many veterans, by the way, never spoke to me about what he had experienced or seen. And that was because? I think there is something in those experiences that make men close up. It's hard for them to relate it. So what drove you down to the recruiting office was hardly what you expected, and when you experienced it, you were saying there was a big difference between what you oh, expected. It was in- so incredible that I, w- I was almost speechless. Mm-hmm. Okay, what did they try to do to you when well, you got into the Army? Can you remember all of that? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I thought I was going to be a musician. Someone told me at Fort Monmouth they're making movies for the armed forces. And you're such a good player. You tell them you're a musician. You'll get in there. You'll be play- making soundtracks for so the let's, army. So let's make sure that everybody understands that you already were a very accomplished violin player. I was, but my parents were like many first-generation emigres to this country. Uh, their parents were. And they wanted to make certain that I would have a better life than they would. So practical things first. You know, to be a musician was probably like being an actor, the most impractical thing you could pick. They said, pick something, get an education. Then if you want to be a musician, you'll be a musician. (laughs) So which was in many of our cases as we became musicians, exactly the right thing to do, only they didn't know it by telling you not to do it. Yeah. There was a... A reason to do it, right? Right. Yeah. And so you're very good. And you let's go back to Fort Monmouth. You think, well, I'm a good fiddle player. They'll take me and they'll put me in the Army Band or something, Army right. Orchestra. But or... I never went to Fort Monmouth. Oh, I see. I went down to Camden, New Jersey, to Fort Dix, which ah. was the first place you're supposed to go to sign up. <laughs> I had my father's piece of paper Which was in my quite hand. a mill, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, first I went to the local area, and they signed me up. They put me on a bus to Fort Dix. And all through Fort Dix, I kept screaming, you know, I'm a musician. I'm supposed to be in the band, you know. They said, sure, sure, sure. Take this test. Take this test. Well, they read my my resume, so to speak, and they see I had a a year of pre-journalism in college. And they said, you know something? We can make use of that musical ear of yours. They gave me a test, which had to do with 
Morse code, <laughs> things of that sort. Yeah. I came out very high on the test. The next thing you know, I went to basic training. And after basic training, they put me on a train for Chicago to a place called the Coin Electrical School, a civilian school. And I was enrolled. And every morning, we would do close order drill in the streets of Chicago. And the rest of the day, we would go to school. But I was also... I discovered a part of Chicago that they hadn't thought about, which was the lounge bars, which all had jazz groups in them. So at night, I'd be prowling the lounge bars in Chicago, listening to jazz, sitting in with groups. And then one day, some big generals came and they toured the school and they huddled with the people and the rumors went flying that they were going to give tests and the people who came out tops in these tests were going to get the cushiest jobs in the service. They talked about being in Washington. They talked about being in New York City at the top of the Empire State Building, beaming propaganda to the world. So I stopped everything and studied like crazy and came out fifth in the class. <laughs> And what they were really doing was preparing a group. Jimmy Roosevelt, whom you may have heard, Franklin Roosevelt's son, was a colonel in the Marine Corps. And he went along with Colonel Carlson on the famous raids on the Pacific that they made to feel out the Japanese and find out where they could be attacked. One of the places they attacked was Macon Island. And they came back, and one of the things they said was that communications during the first 24 hours of any seaborne attack was the key to the whole thing, so that the people back on the fleet would know what was needed ashore and got it there. So they came up with an idea for a special combat communications outfit that would land in the very first wave, set up radios, <laughs> and direct the fire ashore from the uh, ships, tell them what was needed ashore, etc. And that's what those of us who passed that exam were put in. Even number one? You were number five? I was number five. But number one went to? All of us. Like the top ten. Okay. All went. So pick up the story. You have now been classified to be in this elite unit that's going to yes. go be first on those islands so that they, you can communicate right. back to the ships. And they sent us to, not to an army camp, but to a marine camp, Camp Pendleton, California. And there we met Jimmy Roosevelt and some of his, quote, raiders, unquote, these big hulking guys. And for the next six weeks, they took over our lives. <laughs> and they trained us in jungle combat, in landing. They'd throw you off the end of a pier with full pack and everything and make you swim ashore, all kinds of things that I said, you know, what's this got to do with our being top-notch radio operators? And out of this came this unit called the 75th JASCO, Joint Assault Signal Company, the very first in the history of the Army. And in it, were not just Army. They were Navy people, Marines, Air Force people. It was a combined group. And we went to train at Fort Ord, California. And then one day, after we had done a number of fake landings, they took us down to San Francisco and put us on ships. And we were headed, we didn't know where, but we knew we were heading north. And then after we were about at sea for two days, over the loudspeaker came this announcement that we are going to take back the first territory that was captured by the Japanese in World War II, which was the Aleutian Islands. And the next thing we knew, we landed at Adak, Alaska, where they outfitted us for this. We went back aboard a destroyer, and we were landed on Attu Island, with a group from the 7th Division called the 7th Rangers. They landed us in rubber boats, and our job was to land on the opposite side of the island, climb this mountain that looked down on the Japanese, Ugh. and when the first wave came in, we were to start a diversion at the top so that that wave could get in. And What was the weather on the island? The weather was 
like something out of a nightmare. It never lasted more than 15 minutes, but it went from rain to sleet to snow to anything. And we landed in the darkness in this cove. We all got soaking wet and frostbitten. And then we climbed this mountain. And I remember setting up the radio on a ledge on this mountain. Now, these were not these tiny, teensy little transistor radios we have now. No, these are big uh, equipment. it was called an SCR-284, I believe, big enough to carry in your arms. And we set that radio up, and I still remember tuning the dials. And all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, I heard the 1812 overture of Tchaikovsky, and this Russian voice, and then suddenly, this is Radio Vladivostok. <laughs> That's amazing. So you yeah. were fairly close to the yeah. then Soviet Union. Yeah. Was there more than one communication guy, or were you it? There was another group from our unit that came in on the other side of the island with the big landing that landed. Okay, so now you're on top of the mountain. You're yeah. looking down at the Japanese. You know that the other guy's going to be coming the other way. What happens? Yeah. Well, the battle began. Of course, when the landing occurred, all hell broke loose. We finished our job, and then they took us down, and we thought we were finished. But they brought us around to another well, wait, 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 cove. Don't skip the battle. What did you see? Well, the battle was, was pretty horrendous. First, I have to tell you, I was one of the few sorry soldiers in the Army for my first campaign. I had taken my uh, carbine apart to clean it before we landed, and we were on Adak Island, and it rained like crazy. We were in pup tents, and suddenly the sergeant said, come on, we got to go aboard this destroyer. And I said, well, I'm still putting my carbine together, and he said, you get your <clears throat> backside out of there. We're going aboard. So I rolled the whole thing in a poncho, and all the way up to Attu, I kept trying to put this carbine together. By this time, it was soaking wet and rusted, and I landed on Attu Island with a carbine in pieces. And <laughs> when the shooting started, <laughs> I was huddled down, and my sergeant said, Come on, Elisha, what do you think you're here for, a picnic? And I said, <laughs> Elmer, I can't. And he said, Why? I said, It's in pieces in my poncho. After cursing me, he went roaming around. He found a, a dead soldier from whom he took a carbine and gave it to me. So tell us about when it all started, how it started. Well, you know, there is a form to this. There really is. It's, it's not helter-skelter. It's all very carefully worked out by the planners. And what you have is first there is aerial bombardment by planes. They come in and they bomb and strafe the area you are going to hit. Did the Japanese have planes at that point? It was very foggy. And they had no planes, and our planes were really very much confined, so there wasn't a lot of aerial And now what year was this? This was 1942. Okay. A year after Pearl Harbor. So there wasn't much aerial bombardment. I have to say that the planning for this particular campaign was very negligible. It was something they felt they had to do to make a statement that we were fighting back. And so it was planned, we're going to take back this piece of territory that they took from us. Were the Japanese so stupid that they didn't have people to warn them if people were coming up the other side? They never anticipated they that? They knew we were. We were coming. But what happened was the Navy took whatever ships were still operable after Pearl Harbor, and they threw a screen across between us and where the Japanese would come from. And they actually bluffed them. They thought there was a bigger fleet than there was. Mm -hmm. And so the Japanese did not reinforce that island. Okay. So did you actually see a Japanese? Did you kill oh, a Japanese? I don't know if I killed any, but I saw many. After the bombardment, then the naval guns open up, and then you land. You go down the mountain. After that, yeah. Well, we participated actually in two landings. One was the night before when we landed on rubber boats and went up that mountain. Right. The second time we came back to the beach and we went on a small foray around to another cove mm. in which they did strafe and bombard and then we went in. At the time you were fighting with the Japanese, you were clearly worried and scared and you thought you might be dead, right? You don't think about that. Did you hate them? I have to tell you that there was a tremendous 
propaganda effort yes, with in those the days armed it... services yes. to make you hate your enemy. They had people as famous as Chagall, mm. who did special cartoons which made them look grotesque. The Japanese had like skull faces with large buck teeth in them. Mm. They were always small and insect-like. They were made to look like, not like humans, like subhumans. And we were shown films of the atrocities in China mm -hmm. and in the Philippines to make us realize that we were fighting inhuman inhumane people. Well, were they? Uh, we never got to know because they also were propagandized and they were told that Americans, if you are caught, they will torture you till you die. Well, I have just read so, a, a wonderful book by a man named Lut Velman who talked about being imprisoned. He was Dutch and he was imprisoned at the River Kwai and yes. doing work details. Right. And he paints a picture of a pretty heinous group of people. Well, you have to remember that they're culture is different than our culture. They grew up in what was called a warrior culture, the Japanese, in which the warrior is the extolled one in the culture, in the society. And also, they're taught that the victor has to really vanquish the enemy. So once you fight against them and you lose, anything goes. But you also have to remember that some of that, I think, was exaggerated out of context. For instance, the Japanese soldier took pride in the fact that he could live on a little can of fish and some rice every day. They didn't eat sumptuous meals. So when you were, if you were taken prisoner, they gave you what they ate which wasn't very much, and others couldn't live on it. You were never taken prisoner? No. Did you know anybody who was? No. Once we began to fight back, mm. the only time you hear of prisoners is when the Japanese were on the initial offensive in the Philippines and in the East Indies mm. and Singapore and places like that. Very few American soldiers, once the campaign against the Japanese began, were taken prisoner. That I know of. I've heard stories from both sides that they didn't want to take prisoners, and if they caught people quite frequently, they'd just kill them. Is uh, that, do you know anything about I can that? tell you that on Kwajalein Island, I saw my first Japanese prisoners in the marshals after the battle. There was a large compound, and there must have been about 20 or 30 in there. Uh, we passed that compound going back to the beach, and about five minutes later, I heard some explosions. And we all jumped, and we thought there was some kind of counterattack happening or something. And afterwards, our sergeant told us that a couple of GIs had passed that compound and thrown hand grenades in. So now you have met the enemy. You have been firing at them. The people are coming up the other way. They're firing at them. You went around to another side to this cove, and you engaged in combat. How close did you actually get to what was at the time called, because of the propaganda, a Jap? Well, first of all, you have to understand that our role was not as combat people. We were not there to kill the enemy. We were there as specialists to provide communication. Okay, so you're, if, but, but if you're you in there with a, them. A, yeah. fire, a fire situation where your position is being attacked, you have to fire. Everybody drops everything and fires. There are very few people that I have met in combat except for scouts, snipers, people like that who actually saw who they might have killed. Mm. It's very hard to describe a situation in a firefight. Stuff is coming at you from all sides. You don't stick your head up to find out who is shooting at you and where they are. You're covering up. And when you get a chance, you fire in the direction of where the fire is coming from. We're listening to an interview with our own Paul Elisha, host of Performance Plays, commentator, poet, and veteran, and I'm Alan Chartok. Paul, what happens next in the saga of World War II and Paul Elisha? Well, after the battle, which, by the way, as I said, was very poorly planned. We almost lost that battle. Many more casualties than they expected, and people really were done in by frostbite. 
because mm. they didn't give us the proper clothing. I was lucky. I had one frostbitten foot, which I stamped like hell because they told us if you got down to the medical tent, they might lop it off. And then they took us, believe it or not, all the way in the other direction to Hawaii. And we set up our unit there. And from there, we were told we were going to go out on different campaigns. And the first one we went to was the Gilbert Islands, where we went into Macon. Tell us about that. That was the joint operation with the Marines, in which they went into Tarawa. And we were attached to the 165th, the old Fighting 69th Regiment of the 27th Division, and landed on Macon Island. And that actually went by the book. You saw the planes first bombing and strafing, then the Navy bombarded, and then the landing craft went in. But there, too, you see, war is always, who was it that said, it might have been Napoleon, uh, who said that the winner in a battle is he who makes the next to the last mistake? <laughs> Well, many mistakes occur. You often afterwards wonder how you won because of these mistakes. The Navy... Let me just stop you to ask you a question I've asked many people in our World War II series. Do you think that we could have lost the Second World War? There are many, many places where <laughs> I would have thought we might have, yes. You think but, that... you know, there's a standing joke, and it goes something like this, that the Americans are such optimists that what do you think is the next thing that comes in after the ammunition that they land on the beaches? I don't know. The PX. <laughs> <laughs> With the Coke and the beer and everything else. And they say, we can't lose this. We've got too much to lose here. You know, it's a standing joke. But in the battle for Macon Island, as in the battle for Tarawa, the Navy made some terrible mistakes. They misread the tides in both instances. So when you were supposed to be taken in with these landing craft and dropped on the beach, you were actually taken as far as a reef that unfortunately the tides had just barely covered. They couldn't get over the reef, so you were landed on the reef, and then you had to go in with water up to your chest for about a quarter of a mile to get to the beach. And carrying a radio? carrying a radio. Others were carrying equipment and, and rifles and machine guns and things. But what happened was the Japanese really had dug themselves in. They had built bunkers out of coral and palm tree logs, and most of them survived the initial bombardment. Mm. And then as we were coming in, they came out of these bunkers, and they laid down tremendous fire on the beach so that many people were killed before they ever got there. People you knew? The picture that you saw of me carrying the radio, there are two guys, one on either side of me, landing. I stepped in a crater, a shell crater, and as I stepped in the crater, some machine guns on shore opened up, and when I came up, the two guys that had been alongside of me had both been hit. Wow. And the radio? The radio made it in. <laughs> we used to wrap it in, in large rubber batting so that it would float. Mm. And the last 50 yards, I pushed that radio in and kicked behind it to get ashore. And what were you thinking when you realized that the two guys on either side of you were dead? You don't think. I was lucky to be with a tremendous sergeant who got me through World War II. His name was Elmer Kaminsky. He came out of the uh, logging camps up in Wisconsin. A tough guy and a very smart guy uh, who had gone into the regular army because of the Depression. And he said to us, think about the job. Think about the job. Think what you have to do. Don't think about anything else, and that will get you through. And he was right. If you concentrated on the very moment, what you have to do to get in, now they call it, the people who are into yoga tell you it's being in the moment. Well, that's what he taught us. What happened to Elmer? Elmer made it through. He was fine. He made it through, and I stuck close to Elmer all the way through <laughs> the war. <laughs> um, did you remain close after the war? Uh, we saw each other twice after the war. And believe it or not, I called Elmer two Veterans Days ago. He's now in a nursing home because his uh, arthritis in his legs. He can't walk much anymore. 
but I spoke to him. He's still very bright and still has the sense of humor he had when I was with him. He's one of the few people I kept in touch with. We'll be sure to send him a copy of this. If he's still around, I certainly will. So you're on this island, and you take it, and there's loss of life. And then what happens? We were pulled back to Hawaii again and prepared again to go to the Marshall Islands. You know, you're very interesting in that you talk about, you talked in the beginning of the interview about how men don't like to talk about the war. They don't tell their families about it. We've heard Mm -hmm. this time and time again. And yet, when we've done the interview up to now, you've told us about the transport, you've told us about wading in, you've told us about getting out, but you haven't told us about the fighting at all. Well, We're believe not it or not, humor, you've seen the cartoons of Willie and Joe, the famous sure. cartoons of Willie and Joe. Well, there's a kernel of truth in there that absolutely supersedes everything else, and that is that there is a dark humor in war that really helps to save you in many cases. Uh, We had just landed and set up the radio on Macon Island, for instance, and out of the, the palm trees comes this young woman with a grass skirt and wearing nothing else, a beautiful young woman and a young boy and she comes up and tells us that her father had been a an American sailor years before and that she has been on this island during the Japanese occupation, and now she stays with us. And, of course, the lieutenant is coming to check on the position, and he, who is this, he says. And we say, well, she said we helped liberate her. And he says, you better just liberate her on down to the beach. <laughs> So It so, turns out her name was Macon Mary, they called her, and she met a lot of GIs. Yeah. And at what point did you see, I'm going to try one more time with you, did yes. you see the action up close? The action, believe it or not, was the closest at night. Mm-hmm. The Japanese were masters at night fighting because they would confuse you with noises, they'd fire guns, and they'd crawl around. And what happens is that that's where your buddy was very important. You were always back to back, each looking in a different direction. And the order also went out, no firing at night, because it confuses the situation. So if you hear firing, you know it's only the Japanese. We all had a very large trench knives, And you were told, we had been taught to use them in that Marine camp, and you were told if it happens that somebody comes into your foxhole, you use that knife. Paul Elisha, what happens next? Believe it or not, I still can remember on Kwajalein Island at night, the moon sometimes would be very bright. And my buddy and I looked out, and we saw this thing that looked like the shadow of a helmet, and we heard it scuttling toward us. And we prepared to battle with it. And it came to the edge of the foxhole, and it was a hermit crab. <laughs> so you're done with, the, the, with this island, and you go to a series of islands? Is that what happens then? Yeah. Then they took us back to Hawaii, and they got us ready for another one. And this time, we were told, after Kwajalein, we were told we were going to liberate the Philippines. Oh, and your rank all along is private? I made corporal. At what point? I guess after Macon Island. Okay, so so now you're going to liberate the Philippines. MacArthur is out. MacArthur said, I'll return. He's coming back. <laughs> yes. And this was some deal, wasn't it? This was a huge campaign. The biggest armada anybody's ever seen, I guess, except for D-Day in, in Europe. Battleships, aircraft carriers, dozens and dozens of troop transports, LSTs. And by this time, the American military might is being reinforced because, after all, we oh, yeah. lost many of our ships at Pearl Harbor. Yes. Carriers were at sea. And uh, we had repl- not only replaced them, but we had a new kind of flat top that was w- really cranked out very quickly. They used a Liberty ship hull, mm. and they put these flat tops on them, and they just sent them out there. Okay, so tell us about the Philippines. So we were sent into Leyte, actually before D-Day, our little unit, to find out what obstructions were in the beach, etc., and radio it back. And then D-Day came, the landings. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
What? So you say that and just sort of pass over it. I mean, this huge Japanese fortress. You were, oh, well, we were sent there to radio it back. <laughs> that must have been some adventure getting onto that island. Well, there were many uh, Filipino guerrillas mm. who were operating against the Japanese. Very heroic people, by the way. They took chances that we would never have taken because they really hated the Japanese. They'd been living under that heel until we came back, waiting for us. They hid us in the daytime, and we would come out at night and then radio back what happened. So actually, we didn't get to see the Japanese. But the Japanese knew you were there because they were hearing the radio broadcast. Yes, but they couldn't find us. Mm -hmm. Then our first objective on Leyte, we landed on Leyte Island, was the airstrip at a town called Tacloban because once they get the airstrip, they can bring planes in to support the campaign. And having reached that, we were pulled out again. Our unit never stayed to the end of anything. Once the battle was pretty much over, they would pull us out to go to another island <laughs> because we had to provide that initial communications. When MacArthur landed, were you there? We sure were. We had been sent back down to the beach to get a hot bath in an LST and a, a hot meal because we'd been living on K-rations. LST is a is A, a, a landing, landing ship. ship. Yeah, a, a large one that comes in and yeah. they open the doors. And we noticed a bulldozer pushing sand out into the ocean. And he kept pushing it, and this major was standing there, and he said, a little farther, please, a little farther. What they were doing was preparing it so that MacArthur wouldn't get too wet coming in. And there were a bunch of newsreel people and correspondents, and the major shooed them all over to one side. I forget if it was the left or the right. And he said to them, the general hates having his left profile <laughs> shown. <laughs> so they had to be the right. And then what they did was, believe it or not, they went scurrying around till they could find, mind you, the battle was already five days old, you know. They went and they found a dead Japanese body, and they dragged it up the beach, and they left it there. And then this landing craft came in with these men with submachine guns in front of MacArthur, and they all trotted ashore. And with the newsreel cameras going, he walked up to this dead body and looked down and said, that's the way we like to see them, and then trotted into the bush with his... <laughs> <laughs> with his entourage. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, so the Philippines, then what? We were told we were getting ready for Manila, and they were going to give us a respite. And what they did, if you've read any of the history of World War II, they did what they called island hopping sure. to get the Japanese. They would isolate some and go to another island around them. They had landed on one part of New Guinea, and they found that the Japanese were infiltrating their positions constantly. New Guinea was a horrendously thick, jungled island. And so they decided that they would make another landing on the other end of New Guinea to sandwich the Japanese between. And for that, they sent the Australians in. But the Australians needed some communication. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, and while you're taking this time out between the Philippine landings, you can go to New Guinea with these Australians. It'll really be a piece of cake. Mm. And so we went into Itapi, New Guinea, with the 7th Australian Brigade. They, as you may recall, were the famous rats of Tobruk mm. that were being sent home. And this was a little side job they sent them on on the way home. Was Elmer still with you at this Elmer point? Elmer was still with us. And we did little forays into the bush with the uh, Australians to make sure that the Japanese were cleaned out. And that was interesting because the, the Australians fought differently than the Americans. At 4 o'clock, no matter what, they stopped for tea. Amazing. And they would stop and brew it in their little cups. And a, a communication specialist, I can't help this joke, they didn't speak the same language you spoke anyway. Uh, the Australians? No, <laughs> they a also drank warm beer. A, a deviation on English. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, did you make any friends there? Yes, they were, they were great guys to be with. Great sense of humor and very, very courageous. Mm -hmm. They really were. As exemplified by? They had a very taciturn way about them. They'd be sitting and drinking these canteen cups of tea, and all of a sudden 
Somebody would surmise that there were snipers in the bushes. They'd turn around, fire into the bushes, and put their guns down and pick up the teacups again. You yeah. know, they were very matter-of-fact about what they did. Next up? Next up was Luzon, the battle for Luzon. And we landed in northern Luzon and went as far as the mountain town of Baguio, I remember, before we were pulled out. And that was a horrendous battle. How so? Because rumor had it that MacArthur had changed the battle plan. The first plan, they were to go down this big valley directly to Manila. And afterwards, for some reason, he rerouted them through a set of hills on both sides of that valley. The rumor was that many of his wealthy Philippine friends owned plantations in the valley and didn't want them messed up. We never were able to find out if that was true or not. Would it surprise you? It wouldn't surprise me, yeah. not at all. But there were tremendous casualties taking those hills. Next. Uh, we were pulled out of there, and then we went back to, after Manila fell, we were on the outskirts of Manila, and then taken again to prepare for another landing, and this was Okinawa. Uh, and? <laughs> Okinawa was a tough battle. I was there. Uh, my unit with Elmer was assigned to the 2nd Marines for the landing on Okinawa. And we went in with them. Again, first wave. And, and in each of Oh, I, I, I left out one little thing. I had been wounded on Leyte. Well, how did you get wounded? Uh, you may uh, recall in, in the history books the famous Battle of the Philippine Sea, sure. in which we destroyed most of the Japanese Navy. Mm -hmm. When we learned that they were coming, everybody was pulled out. The ships were pulled out of uh, Leyte so that they wouldn't be caught there by the Navy. And the Japanese sent a series of... This was where the kamikazes first started to come. Mm -hmm. We were dug in on the beach with our radio, and there was an LST, one of those large LSTs, that had been unloading munitions and they were right across the way from us, this huge pile of munitions. And then they pulled out, everybody pulled out. And just at dusk, the first wave of kamikazes came in. Mm. One of them dove right into that pile of munitions and blew up, but so did the, the whole pile of munitions. And our position, where we were, just went up in the air. Really? Both of my arms were broken, and I was luckier than than many. And what happened to you? Did they bring you to a field hospital? I went to a field hospital, and I had my arms in splints, wrapped. And I was there for, oh, about a week or so, 10 days. And my friend, one of my other friends, Louis DeLeo, who was a radio operator with me, came to see me. And he said, you know, we're pulling out. We're getting ready for another one. You're going to get stuck here. You won't be with the outfit. And so with the help of a, a young nurse who would help me write letters and things, I went AWOL from the hospital. Really? And just went, went and joined the to, union? I the went unit. back to my unit. Did that ever cause you trouble? Well, my uh, CO bawled me out, but he didn't do anything about it. Yeah. He came into our tent one day, and he threw this Purple Heart medal down, and he said... Here, this is for your trouble. He said, the next time, don't go AWOL and get my backside in trouble. Only well, he didn't say backside. <laughs> but he took me along. <laughs> okay, so then. And we landed on Okinawa. I still had one arm in a splint when I landed on oh, Okinawa. Boy. Oh, boy. And when Okinawa was over, what happened then? Well, I, I should tell you a very interesting story. Uh, on Okinawa, after the, the major part of the battle, when we were pulled back to the beach, the CO called me in one day. And you remember I, I told you that I had been a field correspondent for Yank magazine. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's a guy here who's going around interviewing people. He said, they need somebody to take them around to the units. And he said... You're the uh, journalist in the outfit, so you take him. And that guy was Ernie Pyle. Mm. And I spent two and a half days with Ernie Pyle. What was that like? The most famous war uh, correspondent. Wonderful there. guy uh, who asked me all about myself, what I was going to do after the war. And he's the guy, the reason I went to Indiana University. After the war. 
But I helped him load his stuff onto the landing craft that he went on this little side venture when he was killed. Yeah. And that's the last I saw of him. You say he was the guy who motivated you to go to Indiana. How did that work? Well, when I got back after the war, well, we finished Okinawa, and we went back to Manila, and believe it or not, we were in quarantine looking at maps of Tokyo Harbor when they dropped the bomb. That would have uh, been our next landing. And uh, there's been a great controversy over the dropping of the bomb. You were a yeah. GI. You knew you were going to go in. You knew that the possibilities were that you could oh, get killed. Oh, the casualty projections were enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, from our outfit, we had about, I'd say, through the whole war, we had about 40% casualties. Boom. And we were lucky because, you know, we weren't on the firing line. We were usually just behind it. But it was expected that there would be anywhere from 60 to 90% casualties in that initial landing in Tokyo Harbor. And have you ever reached a, a conclusion on your own as a human being as to whether or not that bomb was justified? Well, see, I have a different take on that. Killing is killing. That's what war is all about. People who make rules for war are hypocrites, I feel because the object is to win the war. Now, the people who make war made war on civilians to begin with, they were the real evil people and who they changed were. warfare. And they were the Japanese in this case, and the Germans? And the, and, yeah. So here it is, post-Okinawa, you're back in Manila. I forgot to ask you one question. You know, this was a great melting pot, this army, or so we are told. You were a Jewish guy. You didn't see a lot of Jewish guys in your unit, I take it. We were a unit of 260-some-odd men, and there were three Jews in it. Did you ever experience any anti-Semitism in the Army? One very graphic incident, and that occurred after we had come back, and we were in tents outside Manila waiting to see if we were either going to go to Japan <laughs> or go home. And time hangs heavy when you're not involved in the service, a payday had caught up with us, which meant that the blankets came out in the tents and uh, the crap games <laughs> began. That's what a lot of them did. And I forget how the incident began. Someone made some remark to somebody else about, come on, stop chewing me down, something like that. The usual, one of those little anti-Semitic remarks. I was reading on my cot at the other end of the uh, tent. That began a discussion which escalated into a series of vignettes, each one telling about how some Jewish person had either conned them or swindled them or something of that nature. Mm. After several, I began to get annoyed. So I got up from my cot, I walked down, I stood by the, the blanket watching, and finally I said, hey, guys, come on now. You know, after all, we had all been together saving each other's lives. And uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? You know, and I said it again. Come on now, guys. Enough of this talk. You know, one of them turned around and said to me, oh, come on. You shouldn't be taking offense. You're a white one. Mm. And now you have to understand that the kinds of racism and, and bigotry that occurred in the army was not just against Jews. It was against all sorts of ethnic minorities and even geographic. If there were a couple of guys that were hillbillies in the mm -hmm. outfit, they caught it too. We had some uh, Mexicans. We had two uh, Navajo uh, code speakers mm. on the radio. They both got called chief. Mm. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I took offense to this. Uh, one thing led to another. Next thing you know, somebody swung. Really? Yeah. At you. And the next thing you know, there were five or six of us in there in a, in a melee. Anybody on your them side? Them against me. No. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I was getting the, the you-know-what beat out of me yeah. when in the uh, front of the tent walked the immortal sergeant, Elmer, Elmer. Kaminsky. <laughs> yeah. And he grabbed them by the necks, you know, threw them, literally threw them out the tent flap and, li and gave them quite a dressing down in the purple language <laughs> mm -hmm. and said, you know, this guy is your part. This is the way we spoke. <laughs>
buddy. Mm-hmm. You guys have been through too much together. What the hell do you think you're doing, you know? And he literally lit into them. And he said, you relied on this guy to save your life. Don't go putting them down now. And they groused about it, and that was, it was over. But those things did happen in the service. Paul, do you remember the day that you were told, it's over, you're going home? Oh, sure. What was that? We like? were in tents outside of Manila, and uh, then we saw the business of the bomb, you know, the, the newspapers with the dropping of the bomb, et cetera. And then suddenly everything was relaxed. Nobody was going out to formations anymore. Nobody was doing anything. And the next thing you know, they had a company formation, and they had a thing in the service called a point system. Depending on how long you had been in and how much combat you had seen, you literally amassed points. And did you have a lot of points? And since we had been in eight combat landings all the way from Attu across the Pacific, we probably, our unit had more points than anybody. And so you were going home so early. we went home very quickly. Do you remember the day that they literally told you you're going home? Oh, yeah, I do. They said, go get your duffel bags. You're going. And we went down, and we, they put us on a ship called the Lurlane. It had been a cruise ship in Hawaii. And we went back with all lights blazing across the Pacific, back to Hawaii, and then back to uh, San Francisco. And so what, if you remember this war, which you obviously do, what do you take away from that for the rest of your life? At first, you put it away. You lock it deep. There are certain things that bring it out every once in a while. I was home maybe three or four days. My father, before I took off my uniform to put on a civilian suit, insisted on taking me down to his favorite lunch place where he used to go with all my ribbons and things. Everybody had to meet me. And I remember we were crossing Cookman Avenue in Asbury Park, and a truck backfired. And I went down on my belly in the middle of Cookman (laughs) Avenue, spread eagled. I was terribly embarrassed, but it was just reflex action. They talk about, you know, post-combat syndrome. Have you experienced that? I don't know what what you would call it. I went through a long period of difficulty with sleeping, I remember. Had tremendous difficulty sleeping. Got very angry if people wanted to talk about the war. I found Mm -hmm. myself getting angry and not wanting to talk about it. Because? At the time, I didn't know because. uh, Because there were things there that I felt were ours. We wouldn't want to share them with anyone else. But one of the things I've found increasingly with my age as I have watched people make new wars is that we have to stop them. I don't know how many other veterans feel as strongly about this as I do, but with every successive war after World War II, I have felt more and more strongly that there has to be a way to find a way to stop the mechanism of war. Because von Clausewitz was right. It's a political mechanism. It really is. But it's the most horrendous, inhumane mechanism that we've been able to invent for a political reason. And I don't think anybody's life is worth that. Paul Leischer. We'll meet again Don't know where 